their persons and their colleagues. Now today we are actually starting with the basic science session, which involves basic research and knowledge to actually practice as a clinician. I am talking about the robotics starting from the initial times of uh, surgical robo, which was started in 2000 in US. We have two hospitals where we do robotic surgery. You can see here, initially it was approved in 2000, but the robotic surgery expanded rapidly in the last 10 15 years. I was actually trained in Hindi Ford Health System in Detroit in 2004. And that was the time when it was in primitive stage. They were also learning Hindi Ford Health System, Dr. Manuminan and his team. It, we used to take hours together for simple things, what looks for every younger surgeon also does in one, one and a half hours. And those days was taking six hours, eight hours, and nine hours. There were three to four robots, and all robots were actually doing single case in a whole day. That was the situation of robotics at that time. It was developed to overcome the limitation of standard laparoscopy. We all know laparoscopy is widespread. It is done by most of the surgeons, general surgeons, gynecologists, urologists, and so on. Now, robotic assisted surgery is a smaller incisions and insufflation of the abdominal space, as we know. It is actually a refinement of the laparoscopy. The robotic camera and instruments are placed through the pores of the body, like a laparoscopy. But the port size and instrument size diameter are different. The surgeon is not in the same console, he is not at the patient, he is not touching the patient, he is elsewhere and he, can, he need not be the same hospital, he need not be the same city, he need not be in the same country also. We can as well operate from here on a patient in US or UK. And the robo assistance is essential and internet connection is absolutely recommended for the tele robot surgery. The components of system in basic robo, we all know the console where surgeon sits and binocular lenses are placed in the three-dimensional image. In fact, it magnifies to 60 times and a motion filtration system is there. Most surgeons initially have some tremor and that is scaled down to minimal. Over a period of time, that tremor also disappears by the surgeon. Rovo has a mobile tower which is as tall as a human being with four arms, one for a camera and three for instrument ports. The bedside card is there, the camera and light source and which transmits images to the console. This is a console where we operate in the Kim's Hospital, Second Rabat. It's a SI machine. The first machine, what I have seen, is S machine in USA, in Henry Ford Health System. Now, at the time, it had only two arms. They were trying to add the third arm at the time. You can see all the three components here. The surgeon console. Luckily, the surgeon is nearby. This is a patient card. This is a vision card. And we all actually learned on the systems. The Outside, there are some uh, operating systems where we can actually learn at least 8 hours of training period essential before you can actually touch a patient. That's a rule at that time. In nowadays, see many hospitals have robots in India also. In 2004, there was no robot in India. This is a surgical robot, what I have seen in 2004. It had only two arms, this black one, one on the other side, and the camera was just behind the stem. Um, this robot also was good. Maybe because two arms were there, the time was a little longer. But it, benefit, it actually combines the benefits of laparoscopic surgery with three dimensional magnified imaging. Now, the advantages we all know they are smaller incisions, less blood loss. Actually, you can get into the deeper areas more easily, and short hospital stay, and improved cost basis also, and lower incidence of surgical complications. Most of these benefits, as we see, are rosy, but actually, long term survival and patient. Survival benefit for a patient is not actually proved. And if you see, this is a team, Dr. Manivainan, P-Body, in 2004. <clears throat> they have trained hundreds of robotic surgeons in the last few years, last 20 years. The most common surgery done by robotic uh, assisted surgery is prostatectomy because their screening system is very, very good. They catch the patient very early. The surveillance system also very strong and patients also are more educated. So, Chance of seeing a patient with advanced prostate cancer in the US is quite rare. More than 84% of prostate actors are now robot assisted in the USA, and it has many advantages like less blood loss, fewer transfusion. Then transfusion is very rare. Actually, most often it is only reserved, but blood is not, not kept in the operating theater for standby. The patient actually is discharged in two or three days. In general, it, the robotic assisted uh, surgery also has the same risks, but some of the risks are little. Listen, like infection, bleeding, discoffenesthesia. 
As surgery improves, the anesthesia time also decreases, thereby decreasing the morbidity for patient. Sometimes there could be mechanical failure because of multiple components. The standby time of a standard robot is 8 to 9 hours. Initially, there were some uh, legal complications for the robotic surgery patients. Then in the court, the surgeons were saying that there is mechanical failure. It can't be attributed to the robo. Any complaint occurs, it is due to surgery and surgeon and not because of the component. Because all components should be checked properly before you actually undertake a surgery. That's the rule. The take home points in this is a rapidly expanding technology in multiple surgical specialties. It is not, not just urology because it's not, it may not survive the urology turnover in a single hospital. So gynecologists, general surgeons and uh, even the radio radiotherapists are using a robo actually to decrease the wastage of the radiation and to pinpoint the focus. Although robotic surgery has some short term benefits including direct perioperative period, it is equivalent to a long term outcome in comfort to open surgery. In fact, there is no study which has shown that robot has done better than open surgery in terms of long term survival or and specific cancer free survival rates. Robot surgery is safe, overall complications are very less, but adding robot to the surgical equation insert another entry for a point of error which has to be taken care of so the maintenance is absolutely essential because it's not just like a rhabdoscopy where you can enter and suddenly you can come out and do open surgery every robot surgery is recorded every complaint is also recorded by the or whichever system and has to be analyzed post surgery the take home points are ultimately the direct manifestation every surgery is dependent only on surgeon all other things are like is wanted labor for him the robo has no intelligence, has zero, zero IQ, so you can't expect it to do anything when you are not doing well. When your instruction is uh, faulty, robot will, is down to cause complication. Now it's not the technology, the potential areas for improvement are reduction error of robotic surgery, more standardized training, we all know the models have changed, S to SI to XI. Now we have the single port robotic system, which is more expensive but still is coming into work in more hospitals. Now, <clears throat> this is about the take home points. I will go to my presentation. This is the basics of robotic surgery. I am going to show, show some of the surgical exercises where we have done. And then found that not only for basic conditions, surgical conditions, we have already done for some of the complicated cases where robot is essential. It has proved its advantage over the standard laparoscopy or open surgery. Yeah, you are into second talk, no? Dr. Kamala, sir? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Thanks for your open remarks and uh, we will uh, request you to continue the basics in robotics in neurology. Yeah. Now, first case I am going to show is robotic partial nephrectomy, where we have seen a young lady, absolutely healthy, didn't have much of complications. On a muscle checkup, there was found to be a little bit of bump on the left kidney. She had no symptoms like loss of appetite or loss of weight. Because of obesity, mild obesity, there was diabetes. Ultrasound showed a 3 cm left real SOL in the mid pole. There is not much enhancement with the contrast medium. You can see here, on this left kidney, there is a small hump here. That's all. Nothing more than that. It's merging with the paragraph of the kidney. You can see with contrast enhancement, little bit of little bit of contrast there. But otherwise, it is not separate from the kidney. Now, we have seen that this, this is a tumor. As can be excised by a partial nephrectomy, you can see most of the kidney parenchyma because fortunately it is on the exterior and could be inactivated easily. There was no distortion of the electrical system. It is at the mid pole of the left kidney. Now, this is the hyalurid dissection where we have taken, we have actually identified the artery, and then you can see the broader one is the vein. This is the vein, this is the artery. After clamping, we have actually cut the tumor. You can see here, this is the excised area, we mark the tumour, about 1 cm all around the tumour and then we have cut the excised tumour, we are closing it with the suture, continuous suture and then we didn't expose the pelicacious system so there is no chance of any leak, it was a clean surgery, no massage, no bleeding, absolutely safe and uh, it took 40 45 minutes for the robotic excision of the small partial nephrectomy. Now, smooth because second day, drain was removed, there was not, nothing much in the drain. On the third day, we have discharged, it showed a clear cell carcinoma, it's about one and a half year now, she's doing well. 
Now, another patient, 35 year old man, presented with vomiting and facial renew after 10 days duration. He was, he was a healthy man before that. And the ultrasound showed mild bilateral hydronephrosis and CT scan showed uh, fibrosis, which are increasing at the level of 3 to 5. This is a standard retrospective fibrosis where you can see the physical system is dilated, the urethra are drawn a little more medially, and then this area was doubtful. We suspected a retropital fibrosis because of the rising creatinine. We have put in double J stents. Stents have gone easily. Both have been kept easily. And after about 10 days, the creatinine came back to 1.6. We thought of exciting the robotic plaque. Now, we have taken the patient out to right, right like a lateral liquid position, excise the plaques, and then we have shifted the patient position to left side, left, uh, lateral liquid test, and then excise the retropital fibrosis. You can see here, the fibrosis is actually increasing the ureter from about almost L3 level to L5. And the actually the tough layer of fibrosis, the fibrotic area, we have cut over that. Some, some places were a little fibrotic, it looked like a bone like thing because of severe calcification. Ureters were much deeper inside. And once we have done that, we have actually shifted the patient position to other side. You can see this is the ureter in the center. What we are removing is a tough fibrotic areas which are actually increasing the ureter to a great extent. Now you can see another video here. This is the fibrotic area where it's cutting through our knife. It's cutting through our knife. It's actually so fibrotic that it was difficult to cut. We thought of just opening it and leaving it. But for fear of severe electric fibrosis, we, have, we can see, see this is the area where there is a dense fibrosis, it was not looking like fibrotic, it's a calcific area. Now, <clears throat> these calcific areas, when we removed that, it had actually calcium deposits as well as plaques of retropatal fibrosis. And this patient recovered in three days, we discharged him, and we removed the stents, it's about two years since that time. The third case is a Muller induct cyst, a 22 year old young man presented with lack of secondary sexual characters. His main symptom was that the moustache and beard are not there. The father was saying that whether he is a female, whether he is going to become an adult male or not. He was taking just those injections at his place at a small town and he had small supravic discomfort which was not very severe so they didn't bother. He didn't have other sexual features for a 22 year old male. There was no facial hair and penile cell was average. Right inguinal testis was there, left testis was normal and several analysis showed classically Exospermia. So we are dealing with a patient of hypogonadism with anisentresis, exospermia, and whether he had really normal male's chromosomal typing, we have checked and it's normal XY. And ultrasound showed surprisingly a 15 into 12 into 10 centimeter cystic lesion in the pelvis, which is a, a piriform shaped thing. He's a, he's a boy, no hair on the chest, and trunkal obesity. We have done the Orbitopexy on the right side because it was inguinal testis. We brought it down to the scrotum, and later the CT scan showed that there is a big area. You can see this is the this one. This is bladder. This is the area, cystic area which is looking looking like a pile form uh, shape, and then some liquid inside. So this was huge behind the bladder and in front of the rectum. So we thought we wanted to remove that. We wanted to see what it was. We thought it was a Muller induct cyst because there was hypogonadism, it was not actually the shape was looking like a uterus, but he had both testes. So probably it is failure of the Muller induct system that has led to a cyst and the port placement. As soon as we entered the abdomen, this is a large cystic area. We poked it into it, it was getting some cloudy fluid from inside. So we assured that the cystic area 